What do you know about PostScript? It comes after PreScript. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well what's uh, okay? What, what do you know about stack-based languages? Have you seen? Okay, not good. Well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, have, has anybody used a pocket calculator? <laughs> yes. Okay. How about one of the HP calculators that does everything's weird? Reverse Polish. Reverse yeah. Polish notation. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like an ethnic insult. It's not. It's some Polish mathematicians came up with a notation that never requires parentheses. Reverse Polish and and uh, yeah. Uh, basic idea with a stack machine, and this is uh, this is actually PostScript language stuff. It's a drop down and net run if you want to follow along. Uh, I, you say a number, uh, pick a number, pick your favorite number. Uh, all that happens is it gets pushed onto the stack. So this is not the runtime stack. This is a stack of PostScript uh, objects that, that show up on there. So I push one, two, three. Nothing happens. Nothing shows up on the, the page that I'm hopefully drawing. Nothing comes out on the console. If you want to print the thing on the top of the stack, you say equal. It's they, they pick some weird symbols for this stuff. So you print the thing in the top of the stack. We just printed one, two, three. Okay. Uh, I push a one, two, three in the stack, and I push a four, five, six on the stack, and I say equal. What does it print? It only prints the four, five, six, and it leaves the one, two, three in the stack. So if I do another equal down here, it's, it's white space insensitive. What, what do you expect to see? First a four, five, six, first thing in the stack. It pops it during the printing process, which is kind of annoying. And then, uh, and then we get uh, so, so. This prints one of them, the thing at the top of the stack, and it consumes it, right? Uh, so the stack is key to the operation of PostScript because everything uses the stack. It's actually a really beautiful way to write a language. Uh, so so uh, yeah. Um, bur -bur 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 -bur. What if what if we want to have we want to do something else with four, five, six, or I want to print it twice? How would I print it twice? I need, I need something that's going to take the thing in the stack and make me more copies. Right? Uh, you need some temporary storage. It's going to be on the stack. Right? Uh, so so th there, there's a built-in command in PostScript called dupe. Makes two copies of the thing on the top of the stack. Does that make sense? So uh, essentially, a 456 dupe is going to leave, uh, and I don't even need the 123. I, I do a dupe. I now have two copies of 456 sitting in the stack. I do an equal, now it's going to print the first one, it's going to leave the second one on there. I do another equal, it's going to, so I should print two copies of 456. What, what, uh, so what's, what happens if I have three equals? It's going to pop the thing, so this is going to try and pop the thing to print. There is nothing on the stack. Yeah, well, uh, one of many things could happen, like the machine could crash or the world could end. I mean, uh, uh, so in this case, all it does is it's going to print a PostScript error. Uh, so this is a stack underflow error, and it's uh, in the middle of doing the, uh, the printing. And then it prints what's on the stack. The problem is there's nothing in the stack. And then it prints what's being executed, and there's a, it loves stacks. There's stacks all over the place. This is a PostScript error, uh, uh, basically. And it's almost always like a stack. Some stacks weren't stacking the way you want them to stack, et cetera. So uh, you, can, you, can do, you can do all, all sorts of interesting stuff with, uh, with stack-based machines. So for example, I can do a 3, 4, add. And uh, what happens if I run that? Yeah, it's probably going to run it, but it's not going to show anything. So I do 3, 4, add, equal, just to figure out what to, and I just switch to insert mode. Uh, so 3, 4, add, equal, uh, let's see, right, run it, and, uh, and, and you, you get 7 because it's taken 3 and 4, add pops the two things from the stack, and then pushes the sum, which is 7, and then equal is going to print the thing in the top of the stack. Do you see, see the, how this works? Uh, you, uh, how do you use add to double a number? So I want to I want to double four. Yep. Yeah, uh, so dupe add. Dupe makes two copies of four. Add adds the two copies together. So this should dupe this should double the number. Does that make sense? So, so the weird part is everything about this language uses the stack, uh, including the graphics and all sorts of stuff. Ah. Uh, so let, let, let's let's do some some dis, some some so so you want to declare some variables. How do you think this is going to work? It's going to use the stack. <laughs> so uh, th there's uh, if I'm remembering right, it's called def. So def it defines uh, two things down in the stack to be one thing down in the stack. 
So uh, you, you, I, you need to put a symbol on the stack. So this is a little bit weird. So, so that for some reason, they the pick just totally random uh, 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 values for this. So slash makes a symbol. So like slash x says like sort of like escaping x to say there's a string x like uh, uh, living on, on the stack. And I can, I can define x to be 4. And uh, see, if I do that before I do my dupe adds, then any time from this point on, any time I say x, it means 4. So uh, let's see, and I should have picked a different number. Like, so I, I just uh, define x to 3. It doubles 3 to make 6. I, of course, I don't even need the dupe anymore. I can just say x and then push another copy of x and, and, then, and then add. Uh, you can even do kind of weird stuff like I can, I can define y to be, and that, so, so y is sitting on the stack, right? I got a symbol y sitting in the stack. And I want y to be x plus 1. So I say x, 1, plus, def. Does that make sense? So it's going to be popping these things. So as it sees the add, it's going to pop the, the last two things, which are x and 1, add them and define it. And then I want to know what y ended up being equal to. So I push it. I do an equal. should give 4. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. How do we comment stuff out? Oh, uh, comments are another totally random. Uh, so they use percent to be comments, because like uh, this is a comment for some reason. I don't know why they chose percent, but they did. So that's uh, that's that's percents. So so we got definitions, we got additions. Uh, you can you can even do you can do really weird wacky stuff here. Uh, w w one of the weird things here. So you notice uh, y ends up acting like a uh, uh, it, it. So if if I go back and redefine x to be some new value, what does y end up being equal to here? So I, I redefine x to be 5. In other words, what did we do? So did I, did I get this thing by value or by name? Well, the, the way I've written it, right, uh, uh, x1 add, this all ran before we even hit the def, right? So I anytime it sees add, it's just going to go ahead and, uh, and, and push that back. So let me see if this, so, so yeah, y is still 4 despite the fact that x is now 5. So if we want y to be defined as some code that's going to run, th th there's a weird way to do this, which is uh, curly braces. It's the same way we define code to run elsewhere. So the difference is, it sees an open curly brace that says, I'm not going to do this until I see the closed curly brace. And, uh, and, and then run it. Uh, let's see. And I think, so let's see. So every time, so, so now when we refer to y, it's going to pull the current value of x. And now hopefully we're going to get 6 if I did this right. Woohoo! Okay. Uh, it's, I did a ton. Actually, I wrote a PostScript interpreter back in 2003 for my thesis. And I haven't really written PostScript since. So I'm somewhat rusty on some of these things. So uh, we've just defined y to be a function, essentially, right? Like, and, and the curly brace are a little bit, I'm, I'm trying to remember how, what the theology is on making curly brace stuff work. It, well, the weird part is, like, defining variables and functions uses exactly the same syntax, which is really wacky. One of the beauties of stack machines. It, actually, and in particular, before you hit the def, you, you have a function sort of sitting on the stack ready to go, and then you do, do, do def, and that... Uh, that, that actually uses the stored function. Questions? Yeah. What is the point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th there's, a, there's a homework <laughs> where you're going to do, you have to write some PostScript. Actually, PostScript is, uh, so anytime you print stuff, uh, print, uh, a lot of page descriptions are written in PostScript, which is weird. PostScript or PDF is a little more common. It's just a wrapper around PostScript. Why would you want a programming language to define a page? Many people ask this, yes. Uh, so uh, why would you want a macro language like LaTeX to write a paper? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I can, uh, uh, so, so the, the, the big advantage here is, for example, uh, if I have a document and I want to print it on letter size paper, then the page is a certain size and I set the margin to a certain size. If I want to print it on A4 paper, it's only slightly different. So you can imagine actually making a document that looks at the size of the page and then figures out how it should get laid out. 
actually, P PDF uh, uh, makes sense to do this. So, 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 they, uh, so, so PostScript is a full programming language, uh, and it's used for page layout, which is, uh, there's kind of double-edged sword here. So for example, you can, uh, if you use functions, you can take something with a mathematical description like a fractal, and you can write PostScript that doesn't have a picture of the fractal stored in the file, the PostScript actually like computes what the pixels should be when you run the PostScript. So it uh, it draws it only draws it when it's printed, which has the advantage that I could have like a 1K PostScript file that can render like a perfect poster size Mandelbrot set. That's you know get you know 10,000 pixels wide and 10,000 pixels high, 600 DPI or something. The only downside, it's rendering it on the printer. <laughs> And you may go take this little tiny 1K file and you send to the plotter and then the plotter has some tiny, crappy, like embedded CPU <laughs> and it just starts sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and like four days later, it finally is done, you know, rasterizing and then, and then actually prints because it doesn't have floating point or, yeah. Uh, so, so, I don't know, mixed blessing. It also means that uh, PostScript that takes over your machine is totally a possible thing. They try and prevent this to some extent in PDF, but it's kind of a... It's hard to hard to keep uh, a full programming interface from uh, taking every machine. Uh, yeah. I, I, have you done graphics? Like, what have you been covering this course? <laughs> Everything you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's valuable. <laughs> uh, so, you 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 definitely need. Uh, uh, have you done GUIs at all? Like graphical drawing? You, you, you'll get to that. I, I think I think near the end of the course is the whole GUI section, QT, etc. Yeah. So oh, it's mostly been about code structure. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Uh, so uh, so we, we get uh, we we get comment format. So l l let's figure out how we do some drawing. So so Im important thing actually. You notice uh, Netrun is complaining you didn't you never drew anything. So the the uh, this is kind of cool. The, the, there's a command called show page. That ejects the paper from the printer with all the marks you want on the paper at this point. So if, if you run this, you get this big blank, like this is this page ready for us to draw something on it. D drawing is a little weird. It's, it's exactly, it's just like all the rest of the compute stuff. Uh, so the, the way we're going to draw is we're going to make a thing called a path. And in, in PostScript, a path is sort of a, a chunk of the page, right, sort of region of pixels. And uh, you'll have paths for like text or uh, you know uh, uh, boxes or, or uh, lot, lots of different uh, options, uh, and and this actually ends up getting used in a bunch of stuff. The, the concept of path is totally there in like uh, SVG, uh, like uh, you know a, a lot of your vector graphics formats do this. So so for example, uh, so I can make a new path. So this st starts me off a blank path, and then w what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially like m uh, show how you would draw some stuff on the page. So I'm going to like uh, do a move to, so it's going to be uh, go to this number of pixels, 100, 100, move to, uh, and then I'm going to go to 200, 200, line to, and then hopefully that's, uh, so hopefully I now have a line. If you do show page, it, it doesn't show anything yet, like nothing, totally blank. Uh, so you, you actually have to, uh, let's see, uh, stroke the path. So this actually draws the path as an outline. You also have fill uh, as an option and, and a million other path. Uh, so so exactly as with the way you do everything, so essentially we're like m uh, setting up a path and then the, the, the path, uh, it, it's not actually on the, like the operand uh, stack, but there's like a stack of paths somewhere. So essentially we've we pushed a bunch of things to do and then we get oh and uh, slash undefined and stroke do, 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 do you have to close uh, uh, minutes? Stroke, stroke. stroke has an R, yes. Mm -hmm. So this hopefully has drawn, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So you notice it drew black, and it's got a certain width to the line. So you can change all of these things either before or while you're drawing the path. So for example, I could say like 10 set line width. So again, it's it's all backwards because it's a stack machine. So so the line width is the width of the lines that I'm going to be drawing, and I mean that doesn't seem that uh, amazing. It doesn't seem that amazing until I do another line two. So I'm going to do a line two two. Let's see, x equals 300, y equals 200. Now uh, it's, it's, this is something that PostScript uh, and that didn't work. Oh, because uh, I have to line two. So we we start at 100, 100. We go up to yeah question. 
Ah, it's like eight and a half by 11 paper is what I've defined. And then it's 72 DPI is for some reason what they decided on for the dots per inch. Yeah. So, so th this is this is theoretically like uh, like on-screen pixel equivalent. I think I think I'm not quite there. I, I don't know. Th that number has changed dramatically as history progresses. Postscript is from the uh, 80s. 72 DPI seemed like a lot at the time. Uh, and, and and you can have fractional positions. So we we, we started. D so we have some coordinate system, right? There, zero zero is the bottom left corner of the page. And then uh, 100, 100 should be there, 200, 200 should be there, and then uh, 300, 200 just up through there. So you just draw a line like that. Now there's this amazing question, what do you do where two lines intersect? Well, let's, let's see what it chose to do. Uh, does that look right, wrong? That looks a billion times better than every other graphics interface of the time, which did this. <laughs> that is just the stupidest way to draw. Uh, right now, there's the, the so, so the standard thing is to draw a line is like yeah, it's a line. But I don't know. You want to draw several lines? You draw several lines, and you leave these just ugly gaping holes between the lines, and it's just like it's the '80s. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> But Postscript was one of the first languages where it draws, it drew lines that were actually relatively okay looking, like not totally crazy. Uh, so I in particular, if you, uh, uh, if, if you change this angle, you can get, uh, you can see, uh, let's see, so I, I'm going to go x equal 200, y equals back to 100, so this is going to be down here, hopefully, probably easier to just run it and see. Uh, so yeah, and you notice this this does get a little bit weird. Like how how far do I really like if if I have a really short little line, so it goes to uh, 102. So it's just basically like come up and then come back down almost to the same spot. Like then it's it's this really uh, uh, oh, see what it did there. It uh, it extends the lines to connect until you wouldn't want. The, 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 it's, it's actually smart enough to decide when you want to clip the uh, the joint between the lines to make it look reasonable. And it was, uh, this is actually a hard problem drawing lines, right? Uh, and and but Postscript has actually like smart people have figured out how do you want to draw lines? What what actually looks good for drawing lines, right? And uh, and essentially like there's and there's configurable stuff for all this stuff of you know how how do you want to extend them? You know what uh, what do you want to have happen when it goes off the end, right? So. I, 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 I honestly like this. Postscript is one of the, it's, uh, it seems like uh, Max actually used Postscript to do their graphics output. It's one big reason why to this day, like a lot of people do graphic design on Max. Because the, the PCs just didn't really get it. They're like, they're lines, how hard is this? Like, <laughs> it's actually kind of hard, right? But uh, f figuring out what the right thing to do when lines intersect is not necessarily that easy. Uh, let's see. So if I if I go to 200, 100, so we should have so come up and go back down. That's, that's my so that is my path. If I close the path, close path th that connects the end back to the start. So I should have a triangle-y thing. And you notice that they, like they they're smart about this. Like they have to clip the end back to the beginning as well. So it, it, it looks good, it looks surprisingly good in uh, a lot of different circumstances. So instead of stroke, I can also fill. So fill will uh, uh, draw a black, uh, right, that'll fill it in. Filling in, how hard is filling in? Got some lines, this seems like. That says easy, but it's down on <laughs> N n n nothing is ever easy. No. So, uh, so, so he he here's a shape that actually gets tricky to figure out whether how you want to fill it in. Sure, uh, if I've done it correctly, I go up the diagonal. I come back down. I go back up the other diagonal and then close. So, uh, yeah. There's a lot of other ways to fill this in, including like having. So, so if, if you think about like the. Uh, uh, A lot of programs mess that up completely because the lines are crossing right in the middle. So what you're filling, you're not filling, and is that what you want? I don't know. 
I don't want the uh, actually I've, I've seen graphics interfaces where if the lines cross it's like crossing the streams right uh, and you end up getting this black like smear that just extends across the entire like rest of the scan line just because it's like error lines crossing yes so with the width being 10 is that like the line the exact line is like the middle of it or does it like uh, the, the, the yeah so so the the actual so if I stroke a path uh, it, it extends from the interior out uh, and, and if I fill, it is just the, uh, the geometric boundary, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Good question. Yeah. So you set the line width. What other things can you set the size line? A million. So we're, we're filling in black. So you can do, uh, I'm going to mess this up, set gray. It's always the wrong, it's the wrong gray. Okay. Oh, I. I I nailed it. Uh, I, I always do like set gray or something. So uh, yeah. Uh, so so you, you can set the intensity. Uh, you can do uh, color somehow. Actually, it's, it's several different ways to do color. So you can do uh, set CMYK. CMYK. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. I think so. Set CMYK color. And it's been decades. Uh, so that should be cyan. Yeah, so that's cyan. So that's using a cyan toner inside the printer. Uh, right, so you can draw simple things. So draw a shape, uh, stroke or fill, uh, so, uh, to draw a path, uh, stroke or fill, etc. Uh, let's, let's we should be able to do some sort of Technicolor Wonderland here. Uh, so, so I, I, I want to do like a rotating, color changing madness of shapes. That's probably pretty optimistic. Wait, wait, this, 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 this should be doable though. Uh, so the first thing we need is for loops. So I'm just going to, I guess, uh, I can show you for loops probably separately and then we'll fold it into the fold in with the graphics. So again, just uh, go to PostScript, drop down. So the way for loops work. Wait, it's a stack machine. How, how would for loops work? Somehow we know the stack is going to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're writing code generating Does it go the other way around? Like if I draw you a stick figure, can you give me the code for that? Not easily. No. Uh, you, you, so if you import a bitmap into like Inkscape, you can trace it. Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator or something, you can trace it and get the lines. Yeah, and and uh, that's actually so. So th there's there's a lot of uh, manufacturing. Like uh, if I want to laser cut an outline, like uh, you want vectors, and uh, surprisingly enough, the we have this laser cutter in 118 that that it acts as a printer. Seems seems a little weird. It, it, it was their way of getting like any kind of input into the laser, so it it, 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 it takes it takes uh, it, it it prints, and then yeah you, you draw a line and that's the laser cutting along, or you yeah you raster an image and it uh, it, it draws it in. Uh, so for, for loops, so th yeah. Yeah. So okay. So so you need a couple things for for loops, right? We need like the range for the for loop. So here here's the range. And we're going to have the start, the delta, and the end. And then you need the code to run. So here's the code. Uh, and and it's, it code is surrounded in curly braces. So I'm just going to print the current thing. So does that make sense? <laughs> so it's code that just prints. It prints the thing on the stack, because the for loop just goes through the range and pushes each thing on the stack. Right, so if, if we run this, this should just print out. I mean, there's nothing too amazing. It's inclusive. Oh, that hurts me. So it, it actually does ten. So if I do if I do zero to three, it's gonna it's gonna run this for. So it's gonna push a zero, run my code. Now if my code doesn't do anything, I just pushed a zero, then I pushed a one, then I pushed two, pushed a three, and then I can print them all afterward if I really wanted to. Uh, Totally cool. They're all sitting on the stack, right? There's no, there's no real problem with that. Uh, so it seems, seems so. So this uh, just coming. Is, so somehow I don't know if this is just because I'm not like uh, stacky enough, but uh, it seems really weird to come in and just silently, undocumented, like the for loop has pushed my loop index. 
I feel much more comfortable if I had like a for loop like I. How would I make I? How would I name it I? So as I, I want to bind it to I somehow. So I, I would I would I would define it as I. I. How do I how do I so somehow in here I need to dig down into the stack. So, so right now I have like zero and then the symbol I and I want it the other way around. How would you? You can, uh, there is some sort of pop. I forget where you push it to. Th th this turns out there's a built-in for this called exchange. So exchange takes the last two things in the stack and swaps them, which starts to get to be kind of pro-tier level use of the stack. Uh, so the, the, the deal is the for loop is pushed to zero and then, uh, and then we've pushed our symbol i. I just exchange, so I have uh, our symbol, our symbol i, and then the uh, and then the value should end up on the top of the stack. So then, w once we define, then we should have just i, and then we can print it. And 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 uh, this is a highly recommended way to do it because otherwise you end up having to do a lot of dupes and exchanges. It's harder to figure out. D does the for loop make sense? That, and d you don't need these comments in here. That's not magic. And typically, it's all just run together on one giant horrific line. Yeah, doesn't that look beautiful? Uh, is there any uh, indentation, anything like that? Not that I've noticed. Like white space is ignored. White space is ignored, yeah. It, uh, m maybe, I, 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 I don't know what best practice is for this. I don't know if it's possible. It, it, it always feels weird the, when, when you first try this. So essentially, I'm, uh, I, I now have i as my for loop index, and then I can do whatever I would want to do in the body of the loop here. So let's uh, let's let's do another one of these. So I want to loop along, and uh, I'm going to want to like uh, at least change the color and probably move things. So let's see. I don't actually want to do like. Uh, I, I, okay. I, let's let's do it. Let's do it the hard way first. Okay. So I'm going to start at an offset of zero, and I'm going to go to it uh, in steps of one to an offset of a hundred, and I'm going to do th uh, basically draw. I don't want to show page because that's going to spit out 100 pages, which FYI is also an easy way to like uh, DOS a printer. It's just like <laughs> four, you know, or is it, is it zero, one, 100,000, show page, four. Like, so this is like, you know, a 12 byte long program that spits out 100,000 pages. Uh, don't do that, please. Uh, so <laughs> let's see, so set CMYK color. So what I want to do is I want to like move the objects along. I guess this is going to make more sense with stroke and with a pretty fine line, like a 0 0.1 line width is really uh, maybe 0 0.2. So I, I get really fine lines. And uh, let's see, so I guess in, in my body, I want to use this wacky like slash i exchange def. So th this basically make, uh, make i be for loop index. OK, I've got i as my for loop index. I guess they're all going to be cyan, and uh, I, I, I want them to move. I want something to move here. I, I'm, I'm going to move one corner just to start with. So I'm going to push I, uh, add it to 200. So my x coordinate is going to just slowly be increasing. Does that make sense? So I'm going to draw like 100 separate uh, uh, of these images stacked on top of each other, which looks a little weird. Uh, I drew nothing at all. This is probably because I messed up. Oh, okay. Uh, what have I left off? Four. <laughs> yeah. Four has to go at the bottom. Okay. Oh, oh, beautiful. They're they're so close together you can't even see them. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do steps of ten, I guess. Or I could I, I do steps of ten and go to a thousand. That's probably hanging off the edge of the page. So yeah, okay. Well, that looks kind of cool. There's weird interference curves and stuff there, but basically this is like the original thing. You shift down a little bit, you shift down a little bit. It, it keeps redrawing this diagonal, so that's why it's like really like scraped <laughs> into the paper. Uh, I, I don't think a print. I think a printer would just do. I think that would that would not quite look like that. Uh, so let's do something more interesting. Let's have the color slowly be changing as we go, right? So I, I don't want it just to be cyan. I want it to be slowly like morphing through different. Colors, it's an easy way to do that. Changing colors. I, I, I just got to do, do a, uh, 
there's probably some way to do random. I, I, I want it to change smoothly. So I'm going to take i, multiply by 0 0.2, and then take the sign, maybe? I have no idea. So what I want is I want it to be like, uh, uh, you know, doing that. Here's, let's see if that did something. Nope. It started at white. Yeah. Oh, cause it, okay, start off with zero, and then you got more cyan and then less cyan toward the bottom. Okay, it, it definitely, it needs to change faster, faster. Oh, uh, their sign doesn't take radians, it takes degrees. I always forget that. Uh, so I, I, I don't even know if I need to multiply it. So I'm going to multiply it by nothing. So, so sine of i is my uh, uh, my cyan. So, okay, that's, that's, that's more like what I want. So I have these stripes of like getting more cyan. This is negative cyan, I guess. <laughs> so I, 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 if I want the absolute value, right? I, sine, abs, probably. I think it's called an absolute value. We'll find out. It'll complain if uh, we get it wrong. Okay, got it. So yeah, so it goes up, down, up, down. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, let, let's get uh, so cyan magenta. Magenta sounds like more fun. So this is this was my cyan channel. Uh, let me do cosine for the magenta. And then yellow and black are still going to be zero. So hopefully we get some Technicolor madness happening there. Okay, yeah, it's starting to look kind of cool, and it's you know so it's all computational. I, so you can actually start. So, so uh, I'm moving only one point to the right because essentially all my moves are just constant stationary except for that one. Yeah. I. You see them faked in almost every program that does PostScript, but I think it does it by basically just draw, 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 draw. I think that's... Yeah, look it up, because it's been 15 years, so <laughs> don't, don't really recall. Uh, right, so if, if, if we want to move... So several different ways to move these things around. I can add arithmetic to every operation, right? So I could do I2, let's see, I100 add. So here I'm manually shifting around the x coordinate for each one of these, right? So so basically when it when it uh, hits hits that point it's going to be shifting. So hopefully we got two coordinates that are now uh, so that oh, the both of the top sides are kind of wandering their way off to infinity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I want the whole thing to move, I can do it by just basically adding i to every possible coordinate. So now this is just going to be, this shape is just going to be translating along. This seems like kind of a, uh, I mean, this is an error-prone and uh, code-intensive way to shift a shape, right? And uh, all I'm doing is I'm shifting it by eye pixels over. That's kind of cool. But, uh, and uh, we got sine and cosine, right? If you want to do rotation, have you ever seen rotation matrix? And then you could do it for every single one of these. That sounds pretty brutal. Uh, probably, probably smarter. Uh, if if I want to shift all of my coordinates, just to find yourself a new function. So it's going to be like uh, shifty, and it's going to. Okay, what is it going to do? It's going to first shift x by taking i and adding it to. Let's see, that was y. Uh, exchange x and y, add. Uh, nothing. You know, that's that's. It's just going to shift y because uh, otherwise I don't know how to do that. So uh, that that def. Okay, so it's going to take. So so here's where you really need documentation. So this takes x and y need to be sitting in the stack, and then you run shifty, and then the result is new x y. So new new x and new new y are both both in there. Y is the only one that I'm doing because basically I didn't want to dig down into find x. Uh, so shift D. So you can you can define. So this is why it's nice to have a full programming language in your file format. If you want to define a little utility function, if you want to define a for loop to to, to make your gradients, you can totally do it and bake it in, and then it, it all just gets evaluated at, at runtime. Yeah. Hopefully this is. Can we make like a struct? 
serve for like points because that would be nice. Or maybe like that would be nice. Because then you could have a, like a rotation matrix or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, there's some way to do all of those things. <laughs> Forgotten how to. Uh, I think you do dictionaries to do structs. I think that's the. Yeah. Uh, so, so d d definitely possible to do structs. Y you can, you can, you can get a lot of uh, uh, computer graphics done with. Actually, the, you know, the easy way to do this would just be to uh, y exchange def uh, x exchange def. So we're digging back and we're naming our parameters, right? So f step one would just be to, you know, and, and name those things. And now I can pull it x and add it. Uh, and then just stick on Y unmodified, and now hopefully we've got the same output. I, I didn't define X as something else somewhere, did I? Oh, okay. Stack underflow means I popped more than I should have. So slash Y exchange def. So this is where the debugging gets tricky. Uh, I had a 100 on the stack. Oh, stack underflow in add. I pushed, oh, uh, uh, add x to i, sure, of course. Right, so, uh, oh, and, and now we're shifting in x, because I said to shift next. Uh, and, and now if we want to shift in y, it's not as awful as it would have been if we hadn't named these parameters. N naming parameters helps you get uh, to a lot of this stuff done. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting x, I mean, uh, so imagine uh, 35 minutes ago, if I just led with this, Total madness, right? Or is it still total madness? I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Question. Um, I think you probably said this, but uh, why is PostScript a stack base? Is it purely for historical reasons, or is there something that makes it good for doing graphics? I don't know why uh, it's, it's stack based. Actually, I, I think if, if you're doing it today, you'd probably just have JavaScript. A blob of JavaScript that emits canvas calls would be like the code. We, we didn't have JavaScript at the time, so yeah. It, it, it's actually really easy to write interpreters with uh, with PostScript, uh, with a stack-based language in general, and PostScript in particular. That the, the PostScript interpreter can fit on like a little like the, the the CPU inside the printer can literally read the PostScript and run it. Surprising. Fourth looks really similar. I don't know what the relationship is, though. Uh, c c questions about this. So uh, we're inside a for loop, I, I guess, which means we probably should indent just for maintainability, readability reasons. Uh, we can manually shift coordinates, but uh, this being graphics, you want to shift coordinates. You want to be able to rotate coordinates all the time. Rotating coordinates uh, can be done with sines and cosines. It's not that easy. And in particular, it's it's not that easy to do super reliably, which is something that you know you're going to want to do a lot in, uh, uh, in in graphics. So they actually have built-in stuff for this. So I, actually, I'm going to save this one because I kind of like this. So this is uh, yes. So this is how we shift ourselves. So if if you want to, uh, so th th there is uh, there's a built-in thing called translate. Translate. Is it called translate? So if, if I want to shift by a certain distance, all the all the stuff I want to render, uh, I I translate. I think it's called translate. And now I don't. I, I can just uh, pass move to unmodified coordinates, and it will all automatically do these translations. So let me show you what this actually sh uh, looks like. So uh, translate is going to shift the position of the stuff you're drawing. So there we are, and then we shift by 10 pixels, and then we shift by 20 pixels. And then we shift by 30 pixels. Can you see what's happening there? Ooh. Th this is shifting relative to where it already shifted, rather than relative to like the, ori the origin of the page. Does that make sense? So th th that's cool, because actually this is nice, because there's a lot of cases in drawing complicated things that you want to stack a bunch of transformations, right? First thing is I, I shift away the margins, and I get to the page, the stuff that I'm drawing. Then I shift to the column that I'm drawing, and then I'm drawing a figure, so it starts at this location in the page. And then the, the figure has two subparts, so I have a subpart left subpart and right subpart, so I'd shift, 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 translate, etc. cetera. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's pretty common to see in really nested transformations like that. Uh, so uh, if you don't want that, 
there is a G save, and this essentially pushes all the graphics stuff, and then G restore. And I hopefully this won't undo the things we've drawn. Uh, let's see. No. So G, G save and G, G restore. It it saves the whole. I think it saves like all the colors. Definitely saves the translation state. Does that, does that make sense? So built-in dedicated functions for G save and G restore. And that's just graphics coordinate system. Uh, cool part about this is now I can translate and rotate. So I'm going to do uh, I rotate. And then we do uh, this composition of translations and rotations, which just starts to look kind of fun and cool. And, and it's, it's a little, it's, the, the, the ability to program doesn't seem that useful, actually. So now we need a few more points in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one pixel at a time. And uh, it doesn't really take any time to do it. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, the, the aliasing kind of hurts me there. I, I think it's because it's not really that high res. If, if it was a high resolution output device, then it would look, it would look really perfect, you know, beautiful, and, and with the colors and stuff. So all we're doing is we're rotating and translating, rotating and translating, rotating and translating. I guess we translate first and then rotate. It's a little weird. I translate first and then I rotate. Oh, it's because it's this has basically got a translate baked into it. Uh, translate and then rotate, or rotate and then translate. Those that are taking the graphics class hopefully know that there's definitely a difference. So if, if I step to the left and then turn 90 degrees, that's definitely different than if I turn 90 degrees and then step to the left. <laughs> <right? That's laughs> <good>, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, and it, it knows it will do the appropriate thing. It will translate and, uh, and rotate uh, correctly. So, so here we're translating along and it's just this nice diagonal and that's, that's going up. And then we're rotating and because this, so, so we actually started down here and then we're rotating around this origin that's shifting up in a pure diagonal. And because this object is off by an inch or two, we get this nice swoopy stuff happening there. And this is, I don't know, this, this just seems amazingly interesting to me. Uh, if, you, if you want it to end where, back where it started, which somehow, like, somehow kind of want it to terminate, you can just make your shift be something that's going to go in a cycle. So if, if I just do, so I'm going to do, uh, let's see, the distance is going to be basically I cosine, and then maybe that uh, times 100. D d d does this seem relatively natural that, like, uh, seems like Yoda's own programming language or something? Like, uh, yeah, start with I, cosine it. Take 100, multiply the two together. That's your new definition for the distance. Okay, I, th I think I need to step 10 to make this look decent. And then uh, my this is my new distance. And I'm going to translate and rotate by the same amount, which maybe or may not be okay. So we do that, and uh, I think it I think it looped back around. Okay, most of it's off the screen. So what I'm going to do is uh, sh so I'm, I can do a translate before the save. So I'm just going to shift this thing over to the right and up by 300, 300. So I'm, I'm hoping to just push it on the screen. There is probably some, oh, hi. OK, what, what did I do wrong? This is super easy to mess up. I, I, I clearly messed up something bad here. Ah, uh, it uh, so we can we can do it three by three, and uh, it's, it's still going to be wrong. So this is this is just uh, yeah, that, that's not what I'm after. This is like scribbling kids drawing. You're moving every single iteration. Every iteration of the for loop, I translate another three pixels in some direction. You don't want that. Right, so so if 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 I want to move the whole image, I have to do it outside the for loop. So uh, outside the for loop, I go ahead and uh, and now I think 300. 300 by 300 is about the center of the screen, probably. Uh, so start. So we we start in a place, we go, and then I guess the cosine is going to bring us back to where we started. Uh, right. So actually, if if these are like degrees, so since we do cosine, essentially we're already doing degrees for everything. So I, I think I just want 360. So yeah, so that's one cycle worth. 
Uh, let's see, if, if I, I somehow want it to end where it started, so I think uh, I'm going to do a rotation. So, so the translation is going to go out and come back, and the rotation is going to keep, I, I don't know what I'm doing. This is, uh, I'm just screwing around. Uh, so, yeah, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, it needs more, uh, more slices. So s essentially I'm just uh, taking smaller steps in every one degree and getting this kind of... I feel like I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't move as far. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I need to move at all. Maybe just rotate is enough. Definitely need some, something in there. Uh, it, it, it might be that the, the translation we're doing is kind of fighting it out with this. So maybe if I translate by minus 150, minus 150. So this is going to center this. It's all in a G save, so it's not going to build up during my for loop. Uh, so is that plausible? Yeah. So that's the okay. So n now, now I can I can open it up a little bit. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Mm. I like how the colors kind of so. The, the deal is we're changing the color with the cosine of this n angle at the same time as we're changing the uh, uh, the position. So that, that, that this is how it's blue in the middle and red on the outside. Because those are those are coupled together. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can put in a multiply, so if, if I want, uh, uh, if I want more loops, I can rotate it faster, like multiply i by 2, let's see. Cool. Uh, so so the, the weird part is you could print this as in PostScript and then you come up with some actual, like, you know, a, a thing. And that's, that's fun. Uh, so uh, actually, let's let's do some sort of text on top of it, right? So so we, we just we have this for loop that draws a bunch of stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, and then and then let's draw some text because I haven't shown you how to draw text yet, and I've forgotten how to draw text. I had my cheat sheet up here. Ah, ah. So step one in drawing text for some reason is you get, you got to pick a font. So it's the same way you define. Like I, I put a symbol like times font uh, in there, and then a font size like twenty four point. And then hopefully I try and select font. And then there's something of an annoying problem in Netrun. I, I, I haven't, haven't drawn, drawn anything yet, but uh, this, I don't know why software does this. It's like, let me ask the operating system about the fonts. Thanks for telling me that. Oh my gosh, I can't find the default font file. Font failed. Can't find the font times. Didn't open the, like, I got it. <laughs> Great. And then, and then it says like, oh, never mind. Times Roman, my God. <laughs> That's cool. Like, thanks for like this. Looks like total alarm bells or something, but it, you know, it still drew it fine. It's yeah. anyway. So uh, okay. So I want zero 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 set cmyk cmyk color. Uh, so it's going to be black. It's going to be times twenty four point if I did this correctly. And then uh, you you got to you got to say where you want it drawn. And uh, I have no idea where it. Uh, 300, 300 maybe. So I'm, I'm going to move move my, all my graphic stuff to 300, 300, and then I'm just going to say like postscript. Actually, postscript is always upper and lower case. I, actually, just for uh, lower case letters were considered an aftermarket add-on, like an extra thing you may not need in this era. <laughs> so it, it's uh, so, so the the default the default printing here is let's see that's uh, oh, hi. I get I get nothing. Oh yeah, come to think of it, I translated already by the 300, 300, so I don't need to do that again. So I just, I'm gonna move to zero, zero. That's probably not quite right, because, uh, yeah, some, some, so somehow, this is, uh, oh, and uh, zero, 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 okay. I always get this wrong. CMYK is uh, ink-based. So it says no cyan ink, no magenta ink, no yellow ink, no black ink, which is white. So I actually wanted one on that last color. I think one means all the black ink. Yes, cool. Uh, it's not centered. You, you can you can manually center it uh, by shifting it. Although uh, honestly, maybe 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 we could work with this aesthetically, right? Like uh, this looks like a book title for a, the new PostScript book. <laughs> maybe we need to do this. Uh, so I can I can crank up the. So how how graphic do we want to get? So sixty four point times. Doesn't that look like a you know, TM? I need the little TM somewhere. <laughs> Let, let's let's do the TM. So let's see. So we gotta have TM. 
Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select a different font. It's probably going to call it a five alarm fire and then say, never mind, I got it, it's fine. Uh, so I do a TM. And, uh, you can move. Uh, I, 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 I'm trying to remember where the TM actually shows up by default. I think, okay, PostScript TM. So, so uh, we move to zero, zero, and that's sort of the center of this uh, bizarre monstrosity we created. And then when you print, it actually moves, so it leaves the, uh, the insertion point right there. So essentially, all, all I want to do is a vertical move to push it up to be superscript. Uh, so so the, the only annoying part is translate is uh, it's absolute by default. I think there is a R move to, like a relative uh, translate. Yeah, so up by, it was 64 points high, so like 50 points up. I think R move to is a thing. Yes. Oh, nailed it. So that's too high. Uh, so uh, uh, again, R move to uh, is relative to wherever you were had, had last drawn something, which is really handy for text, right? Because you want to you know, end up... Uh, stringing a bunch of stuff along like that. So I, I don't know how high this should be. Yes, perfect. Maybe down a little tiny bit more. I should not be messing with this. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And uh, so what all will you mess up doing this? Very good question. Sixty-four is the distance between. Uh, I forget how fonts are measured. Sixty-four uh, is maybe the whole height of a full letter or something. So, so, so the, the deal is uh, the yeah. You got to figure out the origin of the text. So I think like uh, that was like the postscript. And sixty-four, I think, is probably like that height. So if if you want something like TM, it shouldn't it shouldn't like the bottom of the TM should not be starting at the top of the uh, you know the T. The Seems kind of low, honestly. Yeah. And like 50 it, was above the top. Of it. It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, c come to think of it, it might be 64 is like uh, the next line is going to start 64. Uh, I, I forget what 64 means. Uh, th th these are all things that you would have to agonize about if you really were you know, building a system like this. Uh, so, so you notice, for example, the I takes less width than the capital S. And. Uh, Postscript was one of the first to actually have the proportional font printing as a thing. Because again, so, so in, in the era, the standard thing that you would be printing would just be on a dot matrix and it'd be some awful text or something, right? Just like, you'd, you'd literally, instead of drawing a line across the top of the screen, you'd use this, a row of asterisks. Like ASCII art was all you had. And uh, the, but Postscript was, I feel like, just wildly advanced for the time. Questions? So it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of beautiful and amazing to be able to make like for loops and stuff, but uh, I think a, a lot of programs emit postscript, but they don't emit really that fancy of postscript. Uh, and and uh, so you can literally take this code, I think, uh, let's see, so let, let's try this out. So I'm going to take this code, so here, here I am at the command line, and uh, I'm just going to uh, fill in the code, so this is like my uh, fancy, uh, this is the book title, book cover. So just write that as a file, it's show page, and then uh, uh, you can use, I, I thought I had Adobe Acrobat on here, and it turns out I don't, so this is the book t cover. So like uh, uh, this, this totally shows up in like my you know my, my editor. You can do uh, uh, you can convert it to PDF with uh, PS2 PDF, and uh, now it ha now it's PDF. And you notice it's basically oh, it got a little bigger. C cool part about this is that uh, so so this literally is a PDF file, and uh, if if you zoom in. Th these are real, actual lines that it's drawing. It's ne and it's it's real, actual text with the uh, you know the the real. Uh, th th there's no resolution to this, right? It's not like a rasterized JPEG or PNG or something. It, it's like actual you know in instructions to uh, uh, to draw the thing, which is good. Uh, SVG uh, SVG is kind of the modern equivalent, and SVG inherited a ton of stuff from PostScript. All all the you know, like the line width and the uh, the move to's and line to's and stuff, those are all straight out of PostScript. Questions? I, I think for the homework you got to draw a box, got to draw a shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
<laughs> I have the cover done. Uh, <laughs> this is probably time to get the advance from the publisher. Just say, like, we have this amazing cover. The cover itself is written in PostScript. Just read the book yeah. in PostScript instead of LaTeX. Gosh. It's, it's theoretically possible to go and do like the line breaks in the PostScript file itself. That would, that's not, so, so if, if you're trying to print something, you're tri typically printing something from, you know, you, you have some uh, internal data structures the program has and you want to emit them at, at, on a page. You usually have like really simple kind of programmatic PostScript. But the, the cool part of it being a programming language is if you need to do a, a bunch of stuff the same way, you can do, you know, DAFs or for loops to, you know, to essentially compress the file. And that was, that was considered like a pretty cool, interesting idea that I could have a file that's also, you know, a program and, and then can, and, and it is interesting because uh, PostScript files can respond to things that are on the printer. Like uh, I'm using that uh, set, uh, let's see, set CMYK color. If it's a black and white printer, the document itself could be smart enough to say, ah, I'll figure out how to you know, make this work in black and white, M make it look right R rather than, and you know, m maybe it has to you know, uh, leave more space because you don't have color to distinguish the different lines or it has to adjust the line thickness, right? All that stuff is totally doable, which is, is, is scary. The downside, uh, if you mess up anything, like there, set line width does an underflow and uh, you, you get this kind of error and then it tries to keep running somehow, so we get the postscript part, but we're missing pieces of the page because the for loop like crashed, right? So parts of your document will crash, which is a little scary. Uh, and uh, anybody that does any substantial amount of graphic design, like you know, people send them PDFs, people send them EPS files, which is an encapsulated postscript, right? And that's a typical way that published uh, documents get their figures in the document and. Uh, then the document crashes, right? The, uh, the image you sent me crashes. And then you have to figure out like what's different about your runtime environment versus my runtime environment. So here, like we're running all this stuff in ghost script, which is a, you know, it's a, this nice free uh, sort of language for doing this. And uh, there's a lot of other, uh, so I could, uh, now that I have a PDF, then I could uh, look at that in Chrome. And of course, Chrome's viewer is not quite the same. No, but that uh, yeah, looks looks pretty good. I, I don't know if I can zoom in. Yeah, it looks. Uh, it's so it's still respecting. Uh, it's, for some reason, a lot of them like you don't want to zoom any more than that. It's just as much as you want to zoom. Uh, for some reason. Uh, quest questions. That was a lot of info dump. I was doing a walkthrough of the University of Illinois campus and I wanted to have stop signs and actually one of my personal pet peeves is where stop signs in like simulations are not perfect real stop signs. So I wanted the actual real stop signs. So I went to the Manual of Uniform Control of Traffic Devices and uh, at the time there was not a good tool to just extract like the stop sign, the yield sign, the, all of the different signs. So I wrote the PostScript interpreter uh, to extract those things out of the, the manual. It was this giant PDF, converted the PDF to PostScript, then I could actually like chew through the PostScript and pull out the actual primitives, and then I could rasterize as many resolution I wanted. Actually, I, I think all that stuff is still there somewhere. So on, on my homepage, uh, it was a... Because I really wanted... Uh, yeah. I wanted a stop sign image, so stop, you know, like, you know, these are the correct stop signs. That's actually a stop sign instead of, like, the font will be wrong. <laughs> That's, that was just not okay. And uh, there's there's a lot of these. So, you know, I didn't I didn't really want to do these all by hand one at a time, so I just wrote, a, wrote some code that finds the figure part and then just saves the figure as a separate, uh, and, and you can get them as, like, uh, uh, you know the EPS, which is basically the original, or, or different rasters, you know, things. Or it does look like our uh, the gamma is not quite right there. 
the gamma is better there. I don't know. I, I haven't I haven't looked again. This 2003 was literally about the last time I touched PostScript. This was kind of the hard way to make my life easier, which is uh, hey, programming, right? That's uh, <laughs> we do that a lot. Uh, but now, if I ever need to like pull stuff out of a PDF file, I have a I have a workflow for doing it. It's uh, honestly today I think I just do it in Inkscape, and I've gotten sort of lazier about being lazy. <laughs> Right. Uh, so uh, ho hopefully you can do this and uh, uh, should be able to run PostScript on Netrun. You can only do one show page. Uh, Hartman would like you to have one big document with a bunch of you know uh, show pages. So you do the first one show page, the paper comes out, that's the idea. And then you go to the next page and show page. So n and Netrun doesn't support that. You only get one show page. Yeah. Yeah, uh, su super easy. GS. Now you're running GoScript, and uh, it actually brings up a GUI with the page, and then you do uh, you know. So now I can do three equal. That prints the three. I can do the like show page, and then it spits it, like I haven't printed anything, but it, like that, that, there it is. So uh, GoScript. If uh, if you can get GoScript installed on your machine, I, I don't think there's like a, a Mac GoScript is apparently kind of tricky to get installed. It's so pretty it's old. You can feed it a file with like uh, GS uh, cover. I mean that's that's the, and then it just, yeah, just, it's just <laughs> it popped up on there briefly. There's there's some way to make it pause. I forget how. Oh, pr press return to continue. Yeah, you know, GoScript has it, it. It I think it blipped that stuff out of there. Yeah, I, I saw it. It's uh, it popped up on my screen. Uh, GoScript has among the most hideous command line options imaginable. Actually, the uh, uh, oh, dash lowercase s capital device equals like if if so for for net run I want a ppm output uh, out dot ppm. So uh, don't don't mess with those. Just uh, I mean you, you can uh, interactive debug is totally fine. And, and uh, usually what I use GoScript is. Uh, you have the text editor you like, and you have GoScript, and you you're writing the code in in your text editor, and then you just paste into GoScript and see what happens. Oh, it crashes miserably. Where did I mess up the stack? Okay, there. Yeah. Especially like the actual Yeah, uh, 105 pixels per inch, or yeah, yeah. Or resolution. <laughs> I don't know. This this just uh, like this like dash O people. It's not that hard. Just w weird, weird-looking command line uh, syntax. Cool. Other questions? <laughs>